Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Twice Told Tales podcast. Today, we're going to talk to Faizane, who is a master's student in diplomacy and international organizations. Farzane, can you tell us more about yourself to begin with? Uh, hi, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, I'm uh, 24 years old. Um, I'm from Iran and uh, originally from Asfahan, but right now I'm in Tehran. Uh, because as you said, I'm studying uh, international organizations and diplomacy in international organizations. And yeah, that's it. Great. Can you tell us which university you study in and what exactly are you studying? Uh, well, I'm studying in the faculty of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, well, um, my major is uh, actually the name of the faculty is International Relations. So uh, my major is uh, connected and related to the International Relations. Uh, and we are mostly focused on diplomacy, of course, diplomacy in international organizations and uh, different parts of uh, international organizations about uh, the international law in international organizations. And yeah, that's it. Okay, great. So um, can you tell us more about your views on Iran and where in the political spectrum of Iran you find yourself? Uh, well, uh, I don't really uh, actually consider myself like as a uh, reformist uh, or what's with Gary? I'm sorry. Principalist. Yes. Principalist, which is uh, like in Western media, it's usually uh, translated into fundamentalist or conservative, but yeah. the words used in Iran is principalists. Yes. Principalists or reformist. Uh, actually, uh, I would actually consider myself as a person who believes in the fundamentals and at the same time seeking and uh, actually willing to see reforms and developments and improvements in the country. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Just to make a note for those who, know, uh, who, don't, who might not know, uh, the reformists and the principalists are the two main uh, political parties, but they are like there are different. There are other political parties that are associated with with uh, these two main ones and are working inside our. So, as an American, I'm a little confused. Can you reform a government without regime changing it? Uh, reform, I thought yeah. the only way that other countries, like especially the ones in the Middle East and Africa and whatever, uh, they 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 just require bombing. To change, isn't that the? <laughs> so you're saying I'm I'm really shocked that that's the, that's a that's a thing that is. You'll have to tell me more about that. Uh, I mean, I think uh, principle of actually the 1979 uh, revolution was actually seeking to actually have a government uh, which is actually seeking for better uh, actually. Uh, moves and uh, better uh, actions uh, to have a, a better government, you know? That we all know each other because of teaching English. So it's a, uh, <laughs> people are probably curious how we always get different guests on this show. But uh, technically yeah, you're both of our true. students because I was a guest teacher once in an English class and that's how we all met. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I'm curious, yeah, about what reformist means because, you know, in the, in here, it, the propaganda anyway, especially the way the Iranians who live in the West have been manipulated or they manipulate themselves into thinking that reform in Iran isn't possible. And the only way to do it is to like wipe everyone in the government out and build it again, which when you really think about that, it doesn't work because whatever power structure is waiting to change it is going to is going to be the one that, you know, I mean, just look at what America does. I mean, they just bomb a country to smithereens and then they put their own puppets in power and the people who are living in the in the villages or whatever their lives get in much worse so uh it's like uh so anyway i think talking about what reform means um 
within the government structure is really important for uh, listeners to understand at least how you view that process because we've former guests we've talked about what regime change might look like and we couldn't really come to a come to an understanding of what would happen after a regime change so what would happen in a reform process like how would you view that uh, so I guess actually from the very beginning of the 1979 revolution, uh, we have actually a lot of improvements and um, reforms and developments in the, you know every aspect. Uh, you see, uh, before the revolution, we had this regime uh, actually who believe who, who didn't really uh, believe in uh, women's rights uh, as. We have this interview uh, actually that Shaw has with uh, that uh, I think American uh, interviewer. Uh, actually, he when when uh, the uh, actually reporter asks him that, what do you think? Uh, can women actually maybe be a governor in uh, in, in in your country? He says that I think uh, women cannot do that. And because uh, they don't have that ability, and her wife is uh, sitting next to him, and uh, she's shocked, and uh, she's so uh, frustrated about that. And actually, after the revolution, th there was this special, brand new narrative of Islam that Imam Khomeini actually represented to the world uh, that. As the number one leader of the revolution, he was saying that women have the right to come and raise their voices and be in the society and they're valuable. Uh, and I, I see actually when I read uh, the thoughts and uh, the actually narratives of the number one leaders of the revolution, such as Imam Khomeini, such as Ayatollah Khomeini, such as uh, uh, Murtaza Mutahari, uh, Beheshti, uh, they say how actually valuable women are and uh, how powerful they are and how actually uh, they worth, they are worth and they can do uh, even things that maybe uh, men cannot do or even they can be actually at the same level with um, actually men. So of course we have uh, some um, problems, we need some more improvements, we need some um, uh, more things to happen to actually see a better environment in the country. But I think this kind of narrative that they actually represented to the world and to the country specifically, it was something really brand new about Islam and how actually they are talking about women because uh, I'm I, actually I want to talk specifically about women because I know this show is about the actually developments in Iran. Um, so I think it, it actually we have we we've seen that uh, through all these years. And when it comes to uh, the actually idea of uh, the rights of women and improvements in the country, there are um, two uh, actually ideas. One uh, which says that we, we didn't have any improvements, we couldn't actually uh, have any reforms. Another idea is that everything is actually good and we don't have any problem, everything is solved, everything has been improved. Uh, I will not stand with any uh, actually uh, these uh, sides. I say that we had some reforms, we had some great actually improvements as i said this brand new uh, actually idea uh, of islam and of course we need to uh, see more improvements more reforms uh, for example you can see women in the society they have the right to uh, actually work they have the right to uh, go to university uh, they have the right to actually raise their voice. They have the right to actually be in a really 
important uh, parts of the government. Of course, we have some lacks of the law or whatever, that uh, women still cannot be a, actually seen uh, as a president in Iran. But yeah, but can I interrupt you? Like, the you United, had the first the United vice president, woman vice president before America. So people don't really understand. Exactly. I just want to interrupt and just kind of give people a context. And like West, especially Americans, because we've been inundated with Zionist propaganda for like 30 years, really hardcore Zionist propaganda. Like we, when you say Muslim or Islamic government, it's always conflated, like all Muslims have the same culture. But the reality is like diff even different Arab groups have different cultures of how they treat women. And then Persia uh, has a totally different cultural perception of how women should be treated. And so a lot of these cultural manifestations happen in different regions. And because they're a Muslim state, it's always assumed, oh, that's part of Islam. But like, it's very different. And in terms of women's rights, Iran in all of the Muslim world has one of the best situations for women. Like, I mean, like I said, a vice president before America did, and America is saying it's so, it, it's trying to elevate and women so much. Yeah, and the U.S. has never had a female president either, right? No. I mean, in... Some would say so, there's a law about that too. <laughs> we'll yeah, see. exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's like you have like the law doesn't pre uh, prevent women from becoming a president, but um, like the yeah. setting of the society and the political system has not so far allowed for a woman to actually become a president after. Like, and how many years have you had the United States of America where, exactly. where like where like the Islamic Republic of Iran has been in place like in 43, let's say 44 years. So it's a, a lot different of it, process. It's a lot of it's cultural. That's all. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And the same with dressing. Um, Dress codes are cultural and people don't realize how much culture is part of how people act and then how much culture is part of how you internalize what other people are doing is wrong. Like cultural centrism is a really important concept. I, I mean, I studied it as an anthropology student. I just sort of figured that it sounded really basic and that everyone understood this, but it's clear, it's clear that so many problems in society, especially geopolitics, are caused by just a total lack of empathy that other people have different ways of seeing the world and doing things. And you should respect that. It's a fun thing to have people in, in, on Earth that have different ways of doing things. Otherwise, it's just like corporate America, the entire world. Who wants to live in that? That's just a hellscape. So, like, I think it's really nice to encourage the world to have a diversity of humans. And, uh, and that's what liberals say they're doing. They say they embrace diversity. But in reality, they want everyone to do exactly the same as Western liberals do. So like, I mean, a Western liberal, like I've said in other podcasts, I think it's a really firm and important example for people in America to understand, like Western women who want women's rights would totally reject the idea of like, I think the majority would reject the idea of like women walking around topless as an acceptable part of society. But like, somehow they can't understand that putting a cloth over your body is not any different than putting a cloth over your head. It's just a different cultural acceptance of what morality is. And there's a difference. So uh, the West has a very, so it's just so, it's so basic to me, but it is a real problem. And so I think the idea when we're talking about women being treated, how women are treated in Iran, first people have to understand that it's not a Muslim thing. It's a cultural thing that's often mislabeled as a Muslim thing. Because there are, I mean, obviously tenets of Islam that are, are universal, but the idea of how, how the people view women in society has so much to do with culture. Like if you take a Muslim from Saudi Arabia and a Muslim from Iran, and you just, you just they both have the same Muslim tenets, but inside their head, the way they view the role of a woman in the household in life is going to be so different. And, uh, and that's... That's something I think people need to appreciate is like the diversity of cultures in the Muslim world. So this isn't Islam we're talking about. This is Iran. And Iran has a very unique place in how women are treated, which is which is even more uh, upsetting when you see what's happening now, because they should be focusing their <laughs> effort on Saudi Arabia or something like that, where it's a totally different uh 
Anyway, I'll let you talk. I, you know, it just uh, makes yeah, me so that's true. animated. Yeah, you talk about culture in Iran. I think, uh, again, Iran and Islam are really so deeply connected to each other because uh, actually Iranian people, the majority of actually the Iranian people are Muslims and they love it deep inside. And it's something so related to their culture. They actually accepted this actually uh, Islam from their really uh, actually bottom of heart because it was so related. It was so close uh, to their actually basic cultures. Uh, so uh, why actually why I'm uh, talking about uh, Islam specifically and this new narrative, uh, a different narrative actually that we have about uh, actually the political Islam or whatever. It, it really is related to what actually Iranian people, uh, how actually Iranian people see the world and uh, how they believe in things. Uh, and so I think they're not actually, they're not, uh, they, we cannot separate this two actually uh, elements from each other. Um, so Farzana, you talked about how things for women improved. Uh, come like after the revolution compared to what they were going through before the revolution. And there are numerous statistics by the UN and different international organizations and um, a lot carried inside Iran that prove that. I mean, this is something um, that has been proved and it's widely acknowledged. Uh, unlike the memes that we see, like I, I'm sure you have also seen these memes of before the revolution and after the revolution where they show um, like uh, women in bikinis uh, on the beach uh, during the Pahlavis and then women in chador or some form of hijab after the revolution and saying, oh, look how oppressed women are while well, they don't. Uh, they don't bother like just uh, do a simple search and see how the statistics for women's involvement in uh, jobs, uh, their participation participation in the government, um, in uh, like the rate of literacy, women, the number of women going to university, and everything has changed. But uh, I would like to ask you, how much do you think? Um, it has been improving since the revolution. I mean, compared to before the revolution, we know that we have improved. But what about since the revolution? Do you think there is a process of improvement or things have remained the same for women especially? Uh, I think actually there has been improvements because as I said, uh, because actually the number one leaders of the country, they actually believe when they believe from the actually the, the top uh, summit of the country, when they have the, this actually this belief that women are valuable, women actually they, they are actually um, worth it and they can do, they have the power, they have the ability to come out to the society and uh, even actually take uh, important parts in the government. I think it, this actually belief and these t thoughts can uh, actually spread all over the country and people actually uh, believe and especially women will believe in themselves and they go out in the country and they try to actually raise their voices. Uh, I think <coughs> The number of uh, women who can actually study and go to university uh, has been improved. And the number of women who take important parts in the government uh, has actually has been improved. Uh, and of course, there are some uh, things that should be uh, better. Uh, the rights that actually, uh, the, actually the demands of uh, actually Iranian people uh, legitimate requests that we, they have uh, in some actually different uh, parts that can you uh, can you think of any like what are some areas that you think we need more improvement in terms of women's rights I, I can think about this very special uh, actually example of the actual university that I'm uh, studying in and uh, the number of uh, boys are more than the girls that are studying in uh, studying in the university. I think there's still this uh, actually 
a belief that maybe men are more capable of taking uh, actually special parts in the government. As I said, it has been improved, but it still needs more improvements because uh, this actually uh, university, this faculty that I'm uh, studying in is uh, special <coughs> and uh, students are trained to uh, take uh, actually important parts in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, so when I go to the faculty, when I go to the university, when I see the number of boys are more than girls is something that really bothers me. And I think mm -hmm. uh, maybe there should be some reforms in the thoughts and the beliefs of uh, people who have this policy to actually take more uh, men or boys uh, than actually the student, the girl students. Uh, so yeah. So is so sorry to interrupt you. So is there uh, like um, a protocol or some form of limits that they actually accept more um, male into this field and faculty, or is it just a cultural thing that more men are going to this like university and uh, major? I, I don't exactly know if uh, there's some actually written principles about that, but I think it's something that really, uh, first of all, goes in uh, the minds of those people who actually mm -hmm. have. So there's not a law that prohibits, because for some majors, I know that there was, for example, certain engineering majors uh, at some universities, they would accept more uh, male than more female and on the other hand we also have majors where only women can apply for actually and like what it's also important that? um like midwifery obviously oh. and yes and there is one more thing i um i think um yeah um yeah i think after the revolution i don't know since which year uh, for the gynecology, also they they only okay. accept one. That seems reasonable. Yeah, Enough. yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and and in other majors there is not a limit, but naturally there are a lot more women that go to those majors. For example, I studied English translation for my BA, and I remember out of about forty students that we were in the class, we had less than ten boys. Like, yeah. The vast majority were women. Wow. <laughs> yes, even for my for my PhD, we were actually yeah. For my PhD, also we were four women and two men. But in the U.S. And, and in the West, it's really similar. There are certain majors. There's just so such a different discrepancy. Like, I mean, the one mm -hmm. that I'm recently think I've thought of is the uh, veterinary sciences. Like to be a vet, mm -hmm. it's usually like eighty percent women. So. It's a really big difference in the in the gender there, which is uh, it's interesting because it's a harder harder degree to get than a doc than a medical degree, and it's uh, pays less money. So it's like uh, it really shows that women want that uh, rather than uh, being a human doctor. So it's a uh, so I think part of it is okay. like people in liberals in the West have convince themselves that there is no inherent difference between men and women. They've convinced themselves that women and men, there's literally, and now they're literally doing that. They're like chopping bits off and making it so they think men can have babies and they have just like totally gone into crazy land. And, but it comes from this root that they think they have tried hard, so hard to convince themselves that men and women are equal in everything. And this is ridiculous. Because in biology, everyone knows that male animals and female animals, I mean, just look at birds, like the males look totally different than the females. And this is like just a fundamental part of biology and the way hormones work and the way uh, sexually uh, re reproducing animals work. I and mean, there's always a difference. And that, that, that hormone and developmental issues all cause differences in behavior and desires. And then in humans, we have complex cultural and learning mechanisms that then then entrench different ideas as well. Um, and they've done studies showing that that's often not what they're what you're looking at when you see discernment between little boys and little girls. It's kind of an innate thing. 
so uh, I think that's really an important part to see is that when you they try, accept yes, trying to match it. like liberal Western values with the with the con conservative or just a traditional uh, society, it doesn't work because the Western values are have become so insane that it's really hard to to lump. And another good example of what you're just saying is like how women how they show, they portray the freedom of women as women who are walking around naked or like in bikinis or whatever after, before the revolution, oh, it was so great. But in Afghanistan before the war, oh, it was so great because women are just half naked. So, But then at the same time they say, oh, we shouldn't objectify women. We shouldn't sexually objectify women. That's so horrible to do. But they say, but the freedom of the women to be walking around naked is such a great thing or in bikinis or sexual exactly. sexualizing themselves in public is such a great thing but we shouldn't sexually just uh, objectify women and these are like two totally contradictory points which they i'm sure will figure out a way to jump through hoops to make it sound like they aren't but islam and Mus is often or muslim women often view covering up as a way of not objectifying themselves so that they can have a more honest interaction with other people and I've come to understand that. And I think that's an interesting perspective. I would have, uh, you know, it's. I think a lot of people in the West don't understand that. They think it's like an impress, oppressive thing where, you know, some, some like mean male figure in your life is telling you to dress like that. I think that's what a Western person would assume. Like, so, sorry, I'll shut up. Can I add something here? Uh, sure. About culture and actually, um, uh, actually, about the political science uh, specifically, actually, it's I think it's mostly related to the culture or the, some beliefs that even some families have. For example, me myself, uh, when I wanted to actually choose this major, uh, my family was somehow against me because they would say that girls should not go actually study such majors. Uh, there are still uh, such uh, beliefs, but me myself, maybe I was somehow an actually avant-garde to uh, actually come choose this major. Uh, but there are a lot of improvements about this. Uh, actually, they 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 are improving and they are trying to change this belief that actually girls shouldn't study political uh, science. Uh, so I think I can see that as something that needs more improvements, but as at the same time has been improved, of course. And um, talking about actually the equality of men, men and women, uh, and actually women being actually uh, somehow objectified, and the, the word you used, actually, when talking about uh, equality, actually, uh, the problem that maybe uh, some people have with the word equality is that, of course, men and women uh, are not equal in some ways, as you said, because they have, have different, um, actually, uh, biology and uh, different, uh, you know, capabilities. Uh, but of course, uh, in actually in our culture and in our religion, we have uh, some thoughts and beliefs that uh, gives the right um, the strike to the w women to actually take part in actually uh, places and works and jobs and whatever and majors that uh, they are capable of. And uh, so in the society we say that <laughs> some women say that we have to be equal to men. I don't agree uh, with that uh, because yeah as I said men and women are different. We have our own capabilities we have uh, our own uh, powers so we have to find our own capabilities and go and find them and uh, actually be in the right place and men at the same time should do that yeah and then it's about when, when you say equal you're not saying less you're not saying women are less valuable than men you're just saying they're different and i think that's yeah. a part of the language game they play is like when they say equality they think oh well if you're not equal it means you're less no it just means you're different like an apple and a banana aren't equal. Like they're just both delicious fruit. They're just different. So like, I don't, yeah, so that's. Yeah, it's about equity rather than, I mean, that's again, just playing with words, but being equal and being, um, I mean, equity and equality are different and it's 
like like you said, it's just uh, about the difference. It's not that anyone is less important or less um, powerful. Um, and I think in the West, like the only place where they have accepted diversity is actually with regards to gender, like confusing everything and uh, talking about gender diversity when they're not accepting diversity in, of cultures and beliefs and religions and, no. and I mean, cultural imperialism. I'll yeah. push back on that because I think for a time period they did. I think the funny thing about Western liberal values is they shift. They For a time period, they have like a really good goal to get to it and then they shift into some new thing. And so gender was really good, but now they've made it so that gender doesn't really exist because a man can be a woman and like so so men can actually take over the role role of women and pretend to be women and then they're trans and then you, so you have to so like women have become like almost like they have to have a new women's rights movement because you can't say mother's day anymore apparently you have to say like birthing people's day so like even mothers like there's no real like it's it's insanity so like it's funny how they think the whole world should mold to this craziness but yeah yeah that's true so how do you see these recent protests that have already i think um um died out at least where i live i haven't heard or seen any protests uh what about in tehran tell us about that and tell us how do you think this was about or how much do you think this was about women's rights and how much was it about regime change in your view uh, well, I think uh, the very actually uh, first days of uh, actually uh, beginning of the protest, I think it could actually lead to a uh, good point because uh, women, as I said, they have legitimate requests and they have uh, some things that they, they actually believe that needs um, to be improved and some rights that maybe they don't have it, they, they want to actually have it in the society. But uh, in the very first days of the protests, uh, me myself didn't really uh, take it that much serious because before that, there was this actually um, idea of uh, people who have hijab, but they're against the morality police. So I was one of them. Uh, I tried to uh, actually share my idea on my Instagram page. A lot of my followers left the page because I actually because of me sharing this idea, a lot of uh, and, and let's say not a lot of some groups actually supported this idea. And then after that, we saw that, OK, now uh, the, there's this news going on on BBC Persian. Iran international America is talking about it and then everything was just ruined it actually a legitimate request a legitimate raise of voice which could lead to a, a good point was misleaded so uh, me myself you feel like he was hijacked yeah yeah I think I believe it was uh, me myself, I was like, OK, I would stop talking and thinking about uh, hijab and the morality police in the country because me myself, I would think I, I was hopeless because uh, I would I would think that whenever we want to talk about this issue, uh, someone or actually some organizations or some beliefs, some uh, propaganda will come and, as you say, hijack this request. And uh, when that uh, young lady actually um, died, um, of course, everyone was so shocked and uh, felt sorry about it. Um, I was really active in, on, in my Instagram page. I would actually share a lot of ideas about different things going on in the country. But at that time, I chose not to talk about it. I chose to be silent because, as I said, I was hopeless and I would just tell myself that, OK, stop talking about it. And uh, I, I just tried to um, have this routine 
uh, sharing, you know, some routine uh, stories about my routine life in the bus, in my dormitory, actually in the faculty. And one of my followers was like, don't you know what is going on in the country? And I was like, yes, of course I know, but I'm just tired of talking about it. And uh, I would just think to myself that, OK, it's just uh, another thing happening in the country and it will stop. And again, you know, everything will be uh, back to actually the normal way. Uh, but everything actually went on and it, it continued. Uh, I, I tried not, not to think about it, but at the same time I was worried, of course. Uh, then uh, I would check the news about what is going on. They had my friends actually on Instagram. At the very beginning, I actually I know their thoughts that they are against this government and what they wanted from the very first time was uh, regime change. It was not about the women's rights or whatever. It was just something being used to actually uh, the regime change. And of course, we, we see it obvious. It's so something crystal clear. It's not something that I say or someone else says. Uh, when, when I check their actually ideas uh, on uh, Instagram or different places, I th think they don't have this uh, idea of getting their rights, their real rights uh, about the women's rights. They're just talking about regime change. And of course, in Tehran, um, our dormitory is actually north of Tehran. Uh, I didn't see any protests. I actually heard some uh, noises uh, from just maybe two or three people just uh, saying some things, but not real protests. Uh, but uh, actually in the downtown of Tehran, of course, there were some protests, protests that actually uh, was uh, actually lead to riots as I will call that, because um, no protester will say uh, bad words or go burn different places or, or talk about uh, regime change, you know. Uh, so I think it could lead to some good points, but it didn't and it will not because everything is just, I think, again, ruined and everything has been hijacked, as I said. And uh, yeah, that's it. Well, so we, in America, we would, have, we, we would have agreed too that peaceful protests aren't like that until 2020 and Black Lives Matter started burning down like cities and then the liberals had to be like, well, I guess that's also peaceful protest. Um, but I, I'm like I'm interested in your analysis of these regime changers because I I find the propaganda fascinating that people like rational intelligent people will be pro regime change but they don't understand they don't have any vision of what that like they think like I guess the regime falls and then like their favorite like Hollywood or whatever film actor is gonna like all of a sudden be president like I don't understand how the what does that process do you think look like to to a regime changer who you, like do, how do you think they think about that because it's i don't get it you know uh, i think talking about regime change if they want for example liberty if they want independence if they want developments if they want equality or whatever these actually these things that i said uh, they were the slogans of the 1979 revolution. So this Islamic Republic is here to give people liberty and independence, you know, equity and whatever uh, actually people want. You know what I'm saying? There's this area that uh, Imam Khomeini made and actually gave people and uh, he he actually came and made this government with those slogans. So if they're actually see seeking for those uh, slogans to come real, okay, 
here we go. <laughs> There's this area that you can do it. If you want another government to have those slogans, so you're just, you know, doing the same thing uh, again. So they don't even have a, you know, possible, plausible, let's say, believable uh, thought or a leader. You know, revolution needs someone to lead it. They don't have one. Yeah, you know? that's a good point. So, Who's the uh, but they say, Ella Gina they God, say Ella, that that lady, she's gonna come. President. Mike a, Pompeo, well, be vice president. You know what their response is to that? Like when you tell them that you don't have a leader, you know what's what their response is? This they say it's our strength point that we don't have a leader. <laughs> I'm I'm serious. Like That's what they say. Government, like just diverse as F. Okay. No, what is funny for me about regime change, which I believe will never happen in Iran, is that from the very young, uh, actually, actually days of my life, I would hear that this regime is gone or will be gone soon. Yeah, From tomorrow. Tomorrow, yes, or maybe two years. Two years later. From, I mean, I think I was like five years or six years old. I have heard these things, and I am hearing it right now, and it's so funny for me. And I believe will never happen because, as I said, they they don't have even some strong beliefs about that. You know, the 1979 revolution, there were some strong leaders that they had some really deep, strong beliefs and people believed in them, which was Islam. But right now, what is their belief? Or who is their real leader? They don't have one, you know. They just think the revolution is something, you know, is this bottom you will press and then everything is great. Revolution mm-hmm. uh, is something that, you know, everything will be in a chaos, crisis, maybe war, uh, as actually we have seen. Uh, actually, Most of some- them live outside Iran, so they don't care. Exactly. <laughs> some of them have actually, some of them have actually said that even if there was a new uh state in iran they would never come back you know uh, i'm specifically referring to the likes of kabe shahrus who who has bragged about having um ervin cutler as his mentor he said that like people were asking him are you thinking about becoming the part of the new um government that we're going to establish when this regime collapses. And he was like, well, no, I'm not thinking about power. And I don't think I will return to Iran if and even if there is a new state. So you see, just- and, and he is one of he is one of the uh, like leading figures in calling for the closure of the uh, Iranian embassy. And he works very closely with Ali Najad. I wanted to ask Farzan one question. Uh, so you are saying that you're still hopeful that changes can happen within the same state and within the um, like the political uh, apparatus that exists in Iran. Like you don't see a um, like a dead end. You, if people want changes, you think it can happen within the same uh, state that exists. Yes, as I said, we have seen it, we had it, we are having it, and I believe we will have it in the future if if people just open their eyes and see that they have this area to just go and fight for their rights. Because as I said, this actually 1979 revolution came for this to actually give people the right to raise their voices and go get their rights. So if they want a, another uh, actually area, another platform, whatever, another regime, so it, it will be something 
you know, you, they were they're repeating another revolution with uh, with uh, the same slogans. So me myself, I really feel sorry when I see my friends. They don't even just stop for a second and think that what they're what what really is going on. Someone who is outside the country is saying that you have to go there. You have to get you actually get your uh, right. You have to raise your voice. You have to go out in the uh, out in the streets and maybe burn some things or or even kill people. Is it is it the way of you know, you know getting uh, back your rights? It's not. So I think we have this platform to um, get it. If you know you have to have this uh, fair judgment, as I once said, we have these two ideas that we didn't have any improvements, or this idea that we have, uh, you know, everything is fine, and we don't want any improvements, and uh, yeah, everything is good. So we have don't have any problems. I think in the country everything is okay. But no, neither of these ideas are right. We have to have this fair idea, fair judgment of this that, of course, we have some problems. We need some more improvements. At the same time, yes, we have seen it. Women in the country, me, myself, I have this right to go out from my house, to live in another city alone, to work here, to have a job, to study, to go out there in the society and maybe actually take place in an actually important part of the country. And yes, so I have this right. Why don't they see this? It's something crystal clear. What I see, actually my friends, they just think that this is the matter of hijab or this scarf that they're wearing even some of them really don't have this hijab thing you know <laughs> and they're just going out there they're in the universities when you see that the videos of uh, those let's say protesters let's say protesters that girls actually they they say bad words they even through actually stone to each other kill people out there uh, so they are in the universities. They're they're studying. They're out in the society. So they have this right to raise their voices, uh, even on Instagram, even on Twitter, and no one says anything until something bad happens. And when actually it comes to riots, it comes to killing each other, and they they say, okay, stop, you know. Uh, arresting people, stop, stop actually executing, executing people. So, uh, you know, it's something that really, I, I don't really understand what, why they're not opening their eyes and see the reality. Yeah, I feel sorry well, for I, that. I, it's definitely a psychological operation. It's a psychological warfare operation. So there's un, it's undoubtedly what's going on. But I think one of the litmus tests for whether you should be paying attention to anyone's opinion about, oh, we care for Iran, is did they uh, oppose uh, the U.S. on its own, unilaterally, without any international law, uh, like imposing sanctions on Iran, like hurting the most vulnerable people, preventing medicines from going in, and then bullying all of Europe to go along with those sanctions or whatever, bullying everyone in the world saying, if you don't go along with the sanctions, we're not doing business with you. And so it's America without the UN, just on its own, just saying, we want to we want to hurt Iran. And I don't think any of those people who are saying how much they care about the women of Iran had lifted, uh, even tweeted uh, one word of opposing that. So I think if you oh, want actually, to know they how have it's critical. Sanctions. They were very they're, strong I mean, they're voices. supporting it, really, all, all those people. Things. Yeah, and they they yeah. live in a, a sanction, an unsanctioned country in the West. They live free, and they're saying, "Oh, we should uh, hurt those people more." But I care about them. I care about them. Oh, why is the government not investing in this? Oh, I mean, they don't have any money. You you took the money away from them. Then you say you care for them, and then you criticize them because they can't do uh, proper governance. It's like I, 
it, it's all so ridiculous. But the people in the West don't, they just don't understand the level of, of sort of yeah. disinformation that they're dealing with. Like people just think they exactly. understand everything and they just don't. That's so, the problem. Yeah, talking about imposing sanctions, I was actually uh, thinking about this scenario of how actually young people, some of them, not all of them, let's say, or even some people, they are so happy and excited about actually the international organizations such as European Union or the United Nations. They're talking about Iran and they're actually, as they say, supporting them. You know, there's this scenario that people actually come out, uh, in the, um, out in the streets, they have some requests, they have some legitimate demands. They um, go out there, some raise their voices, and then someone tells them that, okay, it's not enough, you have to go burn things, you have to go even kill people, throw, throw actually stone to each other, and then they, uh, 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 think that no one is listening to them and nothing is getting better. And then uh, there are these countries out there say that, okay, if the government is not listening to you, we are, we are, and we are supporting you. And then they're like, okay, so someone is uh, finally supporting us. Someone is uh, finally listening to us. Let's go actually raise their voices uh, through their powers. And then they go out there they say that we support Iranian girls, Iranian women, and in, for example, European Union, in, in the United Nations, and then there, you know, people in uh, inside the country are happy because, uh, you know, at the end, someone is talking about them, and they think that they are supporting them, and then at the end of the day, you see that they are imposing more sanctions on your sanctioned country, and make things worse and they think that it's the matter of the government it's the matter of you know islamic republic and the authorities uh, actually are being hurt by have... this by these yeah, sanctions what they really do not uh, actually notice and think about is that these sanctions are actually affecting ordinary people affecting their own lives not maybe the, they will actually affect some authorities maybe in some ways they will actually uh, hurt the government but mostly it's, it's hurting them it's affecting and them. they know it that that's and the whole point of sanctions like the the western leaders but in the u.s have said openly this is meant to hurt the people so that they put up so that they do a revolution so it's not exactly. a weird side effect and when they say they're trying to target the leaders of a country with sanctions that's they know that's not true yeah so sorry yeah so, it, it is aimed at making people even more angry at their government and then revolt and you know there is um there is a uh, I don't know, tolerance towards all the economic pressure and everything. And you can't expe expect everyone to understand what is actually happening and what is actually hurting them. Like, what, what are these evil forces coming from? Like, the sanctions. Uh, like, you can't expect everyone to understand economy and international relations. But it's amazing how people, as you said, I mean, I'm sure it's not a lot of people. Um, like, for example, one case was when um especially western media were saying and people like Ali Najad were saying that everyone was cheering on the streets the loss of the Iranian national football team against the US but that was not the case even among the protesters like i mean it doesn't make i mean yes there were people who were like well we don't care but cheering the loss of your team is uh, is another level of uh, i don't know like ignorance and and like polls show that yes, there is maybe about if I'm not mistaken about three percent of three to four percent of people who um, were happy. And let's admit that three to four percent is I think is still a lot. 
But there is a majority that it, that does not feel that way. And I think this, the same is true about sanctions. It's not that everyone is happy about sanctions, but those who are happy about sanctions have the loud the loudspeakers and they are the ones who are uh, constantly reflected on Western media. And they give, give you this impression that even like all the protesters in Iran are in favor of US intervention or EU support, UN with uh, like removing Iran from the Women's Right Commission and everything, but that's not actually true about the majority of Iranians. And I'm uh, and like even um, our other guest that we had and was for uh, a total change of the system inside Iran. She was against the intervention. She was she understood that like the sanctions are only hurting people. She understood that um, those uh, foreign powers who are um, like calling for, uh, like, or pretending that they are uh, supporting women's rights in Iran have other interests and other goals, and they don't care about Iranian women. So I think it's a very, um, probably a small minority, uh, let's call it like a fringe minority with unacceptable views. What are you, Justin Trudeau? <laughs> That's how um, the Canadian Prime Minister describes disagrees with but yeah i mean so that I, but in I think this case it's a legitimate ex description in the case of trudeau yeah. he was slandering some some like, exactly civil rights activists yeah yeah and i'm not and protesters i'm not even talking about protesters i'm talking about a minority within the protesters who have ideas that i think come out of ignorance um yeah did you want to say something Farzana? Yeah. Say that maybe they don't even some of them they don't even actually think about sanctions. What they're happy about is that they think that their voice has been actually rising and someone is talking about them and they're helping them, which they're not actually. If some yeah. if if in the worst case scenario no one is listening to them, which I believe maybe someone, maybe even a, a, one person is listening to them. Uh, even if in the worst case scenario, no one is listening to them, no one outside the country will actually support them. They don't even care about human rights or women's rights. As actually you mentioned about this thing that happened last night, uh, they removed Iran from the uh, CSW. Uh, so <laughs> in this commission, we have United States and actually more funny Saudi Arabia so yeah. uh, they will never talk about that country because it's something completely political it's not about humans rights not about women's rights it's not about something that actually they want to help or support or make things better they want they want things worse they want things, they, they don't want anything, I believe, anything good for the country. What they want is just do something to just uh, make things worse and have their own policies as they've been doing even before the Islamic Republic. I mean, specifically, I'm talking about the United States. Uh, you know, uh, remember the actually coup that they actually opted uh, against uh, the legitimate administration of Mossadegh. So never. In 1950. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I can actually, uh, I cannot think if, even about one single example of uh, actually America helping Iran and uh, make things better in the country, even before the revolution, even before this government is. So I think. Well, the only nuclear reactor that you have in Iran was given to you by the US. People don't know that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. Really the first, funny. not the only, but the first. I got the, well, the first, yeah. well, the, what, the, the main re teaching reactor in the uh, yeah. University of Tehran is the same teaching reactor that they have here at uh, Georgia Tech. It was made by the same company and it was donated to Iran from the US, yeah, I, ironically. 
And yeah, I that time it wasn't, for, it yeah. wasn't for good. I mean, they have they had their own things to yeah. You know. <laughs> Foreign policy is always are, manipulative. And then now they're imposing sanctions and they're limiting us and they're fighting with us because of those, you know, nuclear power or whatever. So. Well, that's the excuse. It's actually because yeah, Iran course. poses an economic threat to Israel and uh, and supports Palestine. That's the main. Exactly. I think those are the main objectives. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So as for um, the last, uh, not a question, but last words, um, what is something that you want as an Iranian young woman and uh, student of diplomacy and international organization? What is something that you want to tell the world, especially those in the West, about Iran? Uh, so... It's hard <laughs> to talk about that, but, uh, you know, we are living our lives in Iran. We have our normal life. Uh, we can, women have the right to, as I said, study, go out, work, go out, you know, just be out in the society. Nothing safety. is that. We have safety, yes most important one which they actually take it as a funny part when we say that we have safety they say that okay economic problems blah 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 you know i think what is crystal clear is that every country has its own problems and dealing with its own problems as in us in the us in europe they have nowadays this energy crisis go on and winter is coming so we're not laughing at them or taking as that you know th there should be a regime change in their countries because we know that every country is dealing with its own problems as we are right now uh, and we are dealing with it and we are struggling to make things better me myself as a girl living in this society i think i have this capability i have this right to go and actually take part in my country and be you know effective and make things better i'm hopeful I think I can do it. And nothing is really something, you know, very extraordinary or uh, something you cannot think of. We are ordinary people living in ordinary society. And, uh, you know, media is something that I think they should not really believe in because uh, Iran, is a special country located in a special part of the world and it has actually it has been dealing with a lot of problems um, during these years and uh, i feel that we are improving and uh, yeah that's it so i think uh, nothing is really that much extraordinary in our country or even bad we have this beautiful country i'm from aswan i know satara is also from aswan we have this beautiful city that uh, with beautiful cultures beautiful historical places tourists actually come to our country visit these places they, they don't have any problems uh, we can talk and what I actually see and what I feel sorry is that how propaganda actually has made this country as, a, as an evil, as an evil one. And when tourists come to my country, they're like, wow, you know, they don't believe that this country is that much beautiful and actually that much developed, for example, here in Tehran or in actually Esfahan, you see that these cities are that much developed and we have those even skyscrapers we have you know uh this word metro uh subway mm -hmm. 
uh, and all those things that maybe a normal city a clean is. subway yeah yeah a clean one yeah because yeah yeah with with air conditioning because you know that the the subway in london doesn't have air conditioning <laughs> i've never been in a subway yeah. here wow i don't know this is like you just want to go yeah that's what i've um, i mean subway here is the main part of uh, people's lives in tehran in Esfahan is not mm -hmm. that much uh, the main part but in tehran is the main part yeah um me as uh, actually a foreigner, I mean, from actually another city that I'm living here. I've used uh, met actually subway a lot and I have to use it. And uh, so we have normal life. We have normal cities, even much better than what they think they are. And uh, I think the uh, actually uh, the situation for women in Iran, as I said, is improving. And uh, I don't say that we everything is fine, or I don't want to say that nothing is fine. So we are on the way, and yeah, we can, we can. I see a really bright horizon <laughs> and bright That's future good. for women. Yeah. That's good to hear because we need a, a white pill to end it on. And I would just follow up and say that I think there's a problem with the way people like define themselves and define others in terms of economic success or in terms of like having a beautiful city or whatever. I think those are all good, nice things. And they prove that there's like technical expertise and all that. But like if there was a culture that didn't have that or people were poor or whatever, I they everyone equally has the right to to self-determination and to happiness and right. like it's not just the rich and the and the beautiful who deserve happiness so we shouldn't always try and like justify ourselves by showing how like i'm not saying you're wrong in doing that i'm just saying there's this kind of capitalistic urge in everyone to be like oh but we have this thing and so we're 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 also good people um because I think Iran, even if it didn't have those things, is still a beautiful culture and it doesn't deserve this kind of treatment from from abroad. And it, it's a really sad thing to see Iranians themselves having been so manipulated by constant messaging that they're willing to like intentionally harm their own motherland. Uh, it's really sad. Uh, I mean, I, I really have a lot of criticism of America. I would some days I would like a regime change here, but not really. Um, but I, I, I would. It, just, it would just be really hard for me to say those things about this country or about any country, really. Like I, I don't think people are, are like deserve that kind of kind of treatment. And I think whenever you hear people in mass saying things like that, you have to question who's behind it because there's probably some game that has found a way to manipulate people mentally to get something out of them that they wouldn't nor normally give give them and i think in the case this case it's the basically the the honor of these these people i it's it's, it's more tragic than anything else so yeah but again i think the ones who do understand the propaganda and who are um loyal to the values that um, the Islamic Revolution in 1979 established and um, tried to pursue, uh, I think they are still the majority. And I'm not saying that because of how I feel or how I want it to be, but because of different opinion polls, including the ones with uh, by um, the University of Maryland. And I can just leave the link there for people who want to know, like, for example, more than 80% of people were supportive of IRGC, but um, the reflection that you get the on Western group? media. No, <laughs> no, don't even joke about that. <laughs> no, it's, <a> <laughs> it's yeah, only a joke um, because it's not true. I mean, it's like, it's exactly. 
Yeah, I know. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's also important to see that although I'm seeing a growing uh, number of people falling for the manipulation campaign, I still think that those who do not fall for it make up the majority of, uh, especially those who live in Iran, because they can see the realities of their lives. And uh, it's very important to, um, because I think one of the main um, uh, like objectives of this new campaign, the manipulation campaign that we were witnessing one uh, since September was to show that that's not the case and the majority of Iranians are seeking regime change and they want the collapse of this regime and everyone is tired and, uh, you know, women are oppressed and everything. And it's very important to understand that that's not the case. It's not that the majority of Iranians want a change in the establishment. Yes, the majority of uh, Iranians want reforms and they seek economic ease. They want more uh, equal rights for women. But it's very different from seeking uh, a new establishment. And that's just like every other country. I mean, it's um, whenever there is a protest for fuel prices, for black lives um, or rights, civil rights, or I don't know, like, uh, the, for example, the yellow vest protests, how long have they been going on? And nobody is saying that these people want regime change in France or anything. No, they're making demands. And this is just the same about Iran. Like you have to understand that it's a, a, we have a different culture here, but it does not make us abnormal or anything. We're just normal human beings like everyone, everybody else. Yeah. So does anyone want to make any final points or should we wrap it up? Well, just that your example with the yellow vest and all those, like the only difference is that they didn't have outside forces trying to hijack their movements and overthrow their government. And that's what's happening here. And that, that's exactly. what makes protest now. These forces, these liberals, so do-gooder liberals in the West who think they're supporting a good cause by the supporting regime change, they're just making protest, indigenous protest in Iran that much more difficult because anytime an indigenous exactly. protest occurs in Iran, now it's labeled as a foreign project so exactly yeah so thanks everyone for listening to another episode of twice told tales podcast um don't forget to subscribe to our channel and share this video and leave comments mm -hmm.